The structural versus reduced form war in economics didn't start as a war. It began as a technical distinction between two types of equations. But over the decades, it has morphed into tribal warfare that has shaped careers, determined prize winners, and influenced which types of questions economists even attempt to answer. Today, we're going to trace how we got here and where we might be going. Our story begins in the 1950s at the Cowles Foundation. Here, giants like Charling Kupmans and Trigva Havelmo had developed mathematical foundations of econometrics. Broadly speaking, these were divided into two types of equations, structural equations and reduced form equations. Structural equations contained the quantities that we cared most about from an economic theory perspective. As an example, the quantity demanded of a good is a function of the price of the good and the income of the consumers and other factors. Likewise, the quantity supplied of a good depends on the cost that producers face in making it and also the price of the good that they can sell it for and any other factors that might influence their supply decision. In contrast, the reduced form is obtained by solving the structural equations where the endogenous variables are on the left hand side and all of the right hand side contains exogenous variables. As you can see in this picture, the reduced form has quantity and price as left hand side variables, but it mixes the consumer side and producer side factors on the right hand side so that quantity is determined by both income of the consumer and cost of the producer and price is likewise influenced by those two factors. In the beginning, there wasn't a methodological war about this, there was just a distinction between these two types of equations. Both were considered essential parts of econometric analysis. Beginning in the 1960s and going through the 1980s, uh, computing power grew and this expanded the scale and the, and the scope of the models that could be estimated. As a response, economists began estimating more complex models that were more demanding of the computer. These included large-scale macroeconomic forecasting models that included hundreds of equations, and also detailed microeconometric models of consumer behavior. Leading figures built their careers on this type of structural modeling. Lawrence Klein, was an eminent macroeconomist who fathered the movement of macroeconomic forecasting, while Daniel McFadden applied discrete choice methods and founded an entire field that we still use today. This was the golden age of structural econometrics. Economists believed that estimating more and more complex structural models could lead to better insights about human behavior and, in turn, better policy recommendations. But the cracks were already showing. At Princeton, labor economist Orly Ashenfelter was wrestling with a fundamental problem using an IBM mainframe computer and punch cards. The core issue that Ashenfelter wanted to know the answer to was whether job training programs actually improve the career prospects of the people who enroll in them. The problem is that people enroll in the program in part based on what they expect to get out of the program. So comparing workers who took the program versus workers who didn't would end up mixing people with different career aspirations. And this would in turn affect how well they did in their career after the training. Ashenfelter's radical recommendation was to run a field experiment where workers would be randomized into the training program. At the time, this was considered heretical. Economics was supposed to be about data we can see and models we can estimate, not about experimental randomization like in a science lab. Ashenfelter's intellectual descendants continued to build on and evangelize these methods. They showed that structural models had serious limitations, including making strong, untestable assumptions about human behavior, fitting poorly or giving implausible parameter estimates, or requiring heroic identifying assumptions. The new generation emphasized clean identification over complex modeling. These intellectual descendants of Ashenfelter include David Card and Alan Kruger, who implemented natural experiment or quasi-experimental methods into labor economics research. Other descendants included Josh Angrist and Wido Imbens, who formalized instrumental variable methods and local average treatment effects. Card and Kruger's famous minimum wage study epitomized the new approach. Instead of building a complex model of labor markets, they simply compared restaurants in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where New Jersey had implemented a minimum wage, but Pennsylvania had not. The new mantra was that it was better to have a cleaner or more clear answer to a more narrow question 
then a less reliable answer to a broader question. As these methods became more popular, the war intensified, and this mainly covers the period of 1990s through 2010. What started as methodological disagreements eventually evolved into identity politics. The reduced form camp claimed that they were assumption free, letting the data speak for itself and employing more credible identification. The structural camp fired back that the reduced form folks were atheoretic, implying that their results were meaningless. The structural camp also claimed that it's impossible to answer an empirical question without a model. The battle intensified in the mid-2000s with the popularity of the influential book Freakonomics, which popularized the experimental approach. Josh Angrist and Jörn Stefan Pischke also released a book called Mostly Harmless Econometrics, which implied that some varieties of econometrics were harmful. Critics dismissed these new types of work as cutonomics, or derisively labeled their followers as randomistas. For graduate students, choosing size wasn't just methodological. It had real career impact. It determined which advisors would work with you, where your papers could be published, and what types of jobs you could obtain. As the war intensified, the terms eventually lost meaning. Reduced form came to be synonymous with simple linear models, sometimes, or experimental methods, other times. Depending on who was labeling it as reduced form, it may be pejoratively pointing to less credibly identified quasi-experimental designs. On the other hand, other people might use reduced form to say that it was good empirical work, meaning more credible. Structural also came to mean complex nonlinear estimation, or anything that involves economic theory, or bad empirical work, depending on who was saying it. The irony is that instrumental variables regression actually originated with the reduced form and structural equations from the Callus Foundation days. In the 2010s, several forces turned the tide to cool the war down. A major factor was demand from the tech industry. Companies like Amazon, Google, and Apple began hiring economists because they found that the skills that economists possess could add value to their companies. And the types of Economists that were hired by tech companies included both experimentally minded and more structurally minded economists. The 2010s also had a rise in administrative data and more thoughtful approaches to measuring variables. This explosion in data, both the quantity and types of data available to researchers, expanded which questions could be answered by either type of approach. More recently, AI-assisted coding and cloud computing has made structural methods much more accessible, while also enabling larger scale experiments. Finally, the credibility revolution, as it was called by adherents of the Cardin Kruger way of doing things, has matured. Nowadays, there's much more rigorous scrutiny applied to determine if an identification strategy is plausible or credible. It's more than just finding exogenous variation, it's convincing skeptics. Finally, in 2021, Card, Angrist, and Imbens received the Nobel Prize in recognition of the contributions that they brought to the credibility revolution. This seems to have cemented the reduced form camp's victory, but also has perhaps marked the end of the war by institutionalizing their approaches. Today, we still see both ends of the spectrum, as Phil Hale reminds us, it is a spectrum, being applied in all sorts of fields of economics. The best economists don't choose sides, they choose tools. Development economists run randomized experiments in developing countries, but also build structural models to analyze the deployment of the results that they've found in their experiments. Labor economists use natural experiments to identify parameters and then use those experimentally identified parameters in policy simulations. Industrial organization economists at tech companies use experiments and structural modeling to come up with optimal pricing decisions. There's beginning to be a realization that neither side is right or wrong, but different questions require different methods to answer them. If you want to know whether a particular policy works, then run an experiment. If you want to know what an optimal policy would look like, estimate a structural model. The structural versus reduced form war in economics was ultimately about economists who cared deeply about 
finding the right answers. They just disagreed strongly about the best way to get there. But what started out as methodological debates eventually morphed into an academic war due to academic career pressures and institutional incentives. Understanding this history can help us appreciate the context for why certain studies employed certain methods. It can also help us better understand what each end of the spectrum brings to the table and how each end of the spectrum can be useful. The good news is that the days of bitter war seem to be behind us, and moreover, advances in computational tools seem to be making structural methods more accessible. In our final video, we'll cover how we can combine both sides of the spectrum to make even better econometric estimates and policy recommendations. So I hope to see you in the next video.